Aloha everyone and welcome back to the Kaimana Conservation Channel, the channel where we talk about the ocean and all things ocean related. For those of you that have not been on this channel before, my name is Jessica and I am a professional marine biologist that lives and works here on the island of Maui in Hawaii. For those of you guys that uh, have been waiting for the next video and probably wondering where I've been, the weather in Hawaii, statewide, but especially Maui, has been pretty bad this season. So it's the winter right now in the U.S. Uh, in Hawaii, we more so call it the rainy season. And the rainy season has made it almost impossible to film outside over the last three weeks. We've had a lot of rain, heavy rain, uh, to the point of some areas even flash flooding, uh, houses have been flooded out, we've had a dam almost break, roads have been washed out, um, and all of that water that's coming down on the island is washing a bunch of sediment out into the ocean, which means that we have brown water advisories, so it's not advisable to go out and do water sports, including snorkeling and scuba diving right now. So all of those really fun dive videos that I had planned for you guys within the last couple of weeks, didn't happen. So I will be doing a video today. It's going to be one of the most highly requested videos that I have gotten since starting the channel and talking about my profession and my degrees and that is my thesis, my master's thesis. So for those of you guys that have been on the channel long enough, you know that I have a bachelor's and a master's. Uh, master's is in marine sciences and development and a lot of people have asked me what my thesis was on. So today we're going to be talking about the crown of Thorns Sea Star. First of all, some of you guys may be wondering what on earth is a crown of thorn sea star? For those of you guys that have never heard of a crown of thorn sea star, here's just a little formal introduction for you. Crown of thorn sea stars, also known as COTS, C O T S, are a large predatory sea star that are found on tropical coral reef ecosystems. They, uh, when I say large, they're up to a meter in diameter. I know you can't tell because of the distance between me and the camera, but they're a meter in diameter and they can have up to 22 arms. They're found throughout the Indo-Pacific, so here in Hawaii we're in the middle of the Pacific. They can also be found further west of us in Australia um, and uh, Indonesia, Philippines, that whole area is where they're located. Not over on the Atlantic side, sorry guys. Um, and they are known for having a very unique physical characteristic. They are covered in hundreds of inch to inch and a half long thorny spines that are venomous. These venomous spines are meant to protect the sea star from predators, but it does also make the sea stars look rather intimidating. Crown of thorn sea stars are considered to be specialist predators, which means that they typically only eat one type of prey that is their primary source of protein. Crown of thorn sea stars are coralivores, which just means that they eat coral as their primary source of protein. Their mouths are located on the underside of their bodies in the center of the arms. So their strategy is to crawl up on top of the coral, on top of the food, and they excrete digestive enzymes. So basically their stomach juices come out of their mouth and it covers their food, covers the coral, and then it digests and dissolves that coral tissue and then it slurps it back up like a milkshake. It's a little bit interesting compared to what we're used to. Some of you guys might even consider it gross, but that is how a sea star feeds. As you guys can imagine, a sea star that eats exclusively coral in a tropical coral reef ecosystem is going to have a very profound effect on its environment. Corals are both the inhabitants of a coral reef ecosystem and they are also the habitat. They're the foundational bedrock for that entire ecosystem. So eating your habitat and eating the animals in the habitat at the same time, you're going to have a big effect. In small populations, crown of thorn sea stars are considered to be very important parts of the coral reef and they actually play a vital role in keeping the coral reef healthy. They have a very similar hunting strategy to sharks where they're going for pre-compromised animals. So animals that are sick, animals that are injured, uh, old, weak, anything that puts them in an easy to eat compromised state, that's going to be a primary target. So when that goes for coral, if you have a sea star that goes around eating all of your compromised animals, it encourages the overall health of the reef. 
It also helps to increase biodiversity because it's going around and picking out uh, different individuals from the reef, which allows new individuals or new recruits of corals to come in and settle down on a basically vacant lot where the old coral used to be, and then will in basically encourage new growth. So crown of thorns sea stars, as intimidating as they are, they play a natural native role in the environment, so it is important to have them there. Now that we understand the crown of thorns feeding method, let's take a quick mental leap over to the crown of thorns reproductive method. Crown of thorns are considered to be synchronized spawners, which means at some point in the annual and lunar cycle, all of the sea stars will come out of the reef and they're all gonna come up to a basically a high point in the reef and they're going to synchronize the release of egg and sperm into the water column like a big cloud. When they're up in the cloud, they're gonna mix up, the eggs are gonna become fertilized and they're going to drift off in the current. Now, female crown of thorn sea stars are considered to be highly fertile. As a matter of fact, they can release up to one million or more eggs at a time, like per synchronized spawn. So we're talking about a lot of potential for new recruits. This method is because the plankton or like floating around in the water column is not a very safe place for new little larval recruits to be. Um, more than half historically of the larval recruits will either get eaten or they won't get enough food and they'll die off. The remainder is what gets enough food and then it will settle to the bottom after a couple of days and it will become a juvenile or a new sea star on the seafloor. Essentially, having all of these baby sea stars is increasing the likelihood of having at least a few of them survive until the next generation. However, there is a downside to this specific type of reproductive method. Crown of thorn sea stars are considered to be a boom and bust species. So the boom just means that they will produce a large number of juveniles or a large number of larvae, and they'll have this massive explosion in the population where the, all these larvas will settle and they're going to outcompete one another for resources. So there's gonna be so many mouths to feed that there's just not enough food to go around. And essentially that means that they're all going to starve themselves once the resources run out and then that population is going to crash when a majority of those sea stars die. So that is the bust. So they have these big peaks and then it drops back down and they have these big troughs in the population cycle and that's typically what a population cycle looks like for a crown of thorn sea star. Now the negative side of that is during the boom phase of a crown of thorn sea star population in an area, the resources are the corals. That's what they're eating. So if you have a boom and they out eat their resources to cause the bust, that means that those corals are all getting eaten as well. So all of the animals that are dependent on the corals and the coral reef, which is 25% of the ocean that we know of, um, then that bust is gonna be not only the bust for the crown of thorns, but also a lot of other species that inhabit the coral reef ecosystems. It's really important to note that the boom and bust cycle of the crown of thorns sea star is not uncommon in the animal kingdom. You see it a lot in shrimps and mollusks, so they're not the only ones out there. However, scientists have observed, especially in recent history, that crown of thorns sea stars are having an increase in the intensity and frequency of the boom part of the cycle. So we're trying to determine why is this happening and what can we do to fix it. And now we get back to why crown of thorns are considered to be a problem. Not only are they considered to be an environmental problem where they're uh, basically decimating large areas of coral reef and all the animals that live on it, but humans actually rely on the coral reefs for a lot of our systems too. Our economies, our tourism, our food, our shelter, our medicine comes from the coral reefs. So there's a lot of things at stake when you consider that crown of thorns may result in extinctions of local coral species. Before we continue any further, I need to stop and make a little side note that contrary to popular belief, crown of thorn sea stars are not an invasive species. 
Even though they are often misquoted as being an invasive species, they are native to a lot of the areas where they are considered to be a problem. They do look quite intimidating, um, and they're often vilified as being reef destroyers, um, even if they are not the reason uh, for the destruction of the reef. They often get vilified, and they're usually the first ones that people point fingers at. However, um, because of that spiny look and that kind of like evil look, um, people forget that crown of thorn sea stars are not the only animals that eat corals on our reefs. You get the adorable pincushion sea star, um, which a lot of people see and they get really excited about, but because it doesn't have spines, it's a little bit less villainous. Um, but they also are specialized predators that eat coral. Same thing with various species of parrotfish. Parrotfish have teeth that have basically fused into a beak so that they can rasp the coral tissue off of the limestone. They are specialist predators for corals as well, but rarely do you hear other animals like that being vilified just as much as the crown of thorn sea star. It is extremely important to understand the crown of thorn sea star's biology and where they are in their population cycle before you go into population management strategies. Using population uh, measurement data to determine how many there are currently on the reef can help you to decide whether or not action is necessary. But population management controls like culling animals off of the reef can be very negative if administered at the wrong time. So coming back from the side note, crown of thorn sea stars are not considered to be invasive. They are considered to be a pest species, which means that something that they're doing, their population or their actions, in this case both, um, is harmful to either humans, our food, or our uh, economic security. In this case, pretty much all of the above because coral reefs are so important to us in multifaceted ways, and therefore population management is necessary. This is where government subsidized research comes in. All right, guys, I'm back. Unfortunately, my camera battery died right in the middle of that explanation. Uh, so we were just coming to the end of why crown of thorn sea stars are considered to be a problem on coral reefs. And we are just getting ready to head into the next section, which is addressing that problem. There are several theories that scientists are addressing in their research in order to address the crown of thorn sea star problem. All of these theories can be basically summed up into two lump categories, the top down and the bottom up. So just to break that down for you guys, the top down strategy is looking at the success of the adult sea star, basically asking the question, why are the adults so prolific and so successful on our reefs? This specific line of questioning led them to start looking at the predators of the crown of thorn sea star. As you guys can imagine, being covered in uh, hundreds of venomous spines and being a specialist predator, there are very few specialist predators for the crown of thorn sea star on the reefs. And scientists discovered that there is a specific type of sea snail called the King Triton's trumpet that is a specialist predator for these crown of thorn sea stars. Unfortunately, the King Triton's trumpet has an absolutely beautiful shell. It's no Known to be one of the most aesthetic and beautiful shells in the world, which means that the seashell trade has gotten in on the action and has uh, collected and overfished, um, and in some cases even illegally poached these sea snails off of the reefs. With the removal of the primary predator, the crown of thorn sea stars are able to basically run rampant across the reef. There's no sense of fear, there's no landscape of fear where the crown of thorns are worried that they're going to be predated on and then they their behavior is to hide or to at least be cautious as they're roaming around the reef. If there are no predators, then you don't have to be fearful about moving around. So they freely roam across the reef and they consume large quantities of reef in areas that they wouldn't otherwise have had access to if they were trying to avoid a predator. It also means that they're able to get to locations on the reef that are more convenient and more successful for reproduction. Ironically, the King Triton's trumpets are becoming so sparse in certain vulnerable areas around the world that I had a colleague that I went to school with at University of Sydney while I was doing my thesis. He designed a thesis that was meant to study the reaction of crown of thorns sea stars on the presence of King Triton's trumpet and how that impacted how they moved around the reef and whether or not the reef looked more healthy. 
Unfortunately, after having designed a wonderful proposal, he got all of the grant money and he started to do uh, the preliminary search for these King Triton's trumpets in order to study them. After five weeks of diving, he didn't find a single snail and he had to completely really redesign his thesis because you can't study what you can't find. So uh, as you guys can imagine, that was not only devastating to his research project, but it really goes to show you just how few King Triton's trumpets there are in vulnerable areas like the Great Barrier Reef. So now that you have an idea of what the top-down research theme looks like, let's look at the reverse, which is the bottom up. So the bottom up, instead of looking at the adult sea stars, we are looking on, instead on the other end of that, which is the sea star reproduction and the sea star larva. Scientists that are focusing on the bottom up theories are looking mostly at the crown of thorns sea stars larva or the baby sea stars that are floating around in the plankton after the corals spawn. Our, their primary question is why are the larva so successful? Why are more surviving to become recruits or baby sea stars that settle to the bottom and then turn into adult sea stars? Instead of the lack of predators, this line of inquiry is looking more at environmental conditions that may impact those little larvae floating around in the plankton. So some environmental conditions are going to be uh, coastal runoff, global warming, uh, eutrophication, which means more nutrients in the water, the inverse, uh, dead zones, so lack of nutrients in the water, and so on. Within the category of the bottom-up theory is where my research came in. Like I mentioned before, my thesis was on crown of thorns sea stars. I did my thesis at the University of Sydney in Australia. Australia, and we were looking at the crown of thorns that inhabit the Great Barrier Reef. My research was specifically looking at how eutrophication or the increase of nutrients from runoffs from the coast was impacting the success rate of crown of thorns sea stars larvae as they were floating through the plankton and increasing the number of settlement recruits or the baby sea stars that were successful from that larval stage and then settles to the bottom and makes new baby starfish. Throughout the course of my thesis, my colleagues and I were able to show that increased nutrients in the water called eutrophication, which is contributed by heavy rainfall and coastal development, were impacting the success of the sea stars while they were in the water column as larvae. Crown of thorns sea stars are naturally adapted to oligotrophic environments. Oligotrophic just means that there's not a lot of nutrients in the water. It's very typical over coral reef environments, uh, and the way that you can tell is the clarity of the water. When there's a lot of nutrients, a lot of algae or food in the water, there's less visibility. And if you guys have ever swam on a coral reef or just from the videos that you guys have seen of my snorkeling and diving, uh, you can see it's very, very clear water, which means there's not a lot of nutrients in the water column itself. So these crown of thorns sea stars are naturally adapted to that oligotrophic environment. Eutrophic means high nutrients. So these animals are not used to living in the water column with a lot of nutrients. They're adapted for low. Um, however, they are also adapted to be very responses to large accumulations or even small accumulations of nutrients in the water if the occasion arises. So when the crown of thorns larva is floating through the water column, if it goes through a time period in which there is a larger accumulation of nutrients, it's going to change its body allometry or its body shape and size to take advantage of this abundance of food all of a sudden because you never know where your next meal is going to come from when you're crown of thorns sea star larva. During the study we investigated two things. One was the concentration, so that's oligotrophic versus eutrophic, and the second thing that we studied which hadn't been done before was the timing in which that changed feeding regime was introduced. So we had several different groups of larvae and the uh, larva at one end of the spectrum was kept in an oligotrophic or low nutrient environment the entire time. And on the other end of the spectrum, we had larvae that were introduced to high, high nutrients for a majority of that bipinaria phase. And then we had all different kinds of variety in between. We introduced eutrophic 
uh, water conditions at different stages during development and just observed how they grew. At the conclusion of the study, we discovered that the earlier that the larva was introduced to a eutrophic environment, the larger and fatter that they grew. And the, that also includes their gut area, which is like their little stomachs, um, were able to grow much larger in order to accommodate for all this excess nutrition. If the larva were introduced much, much later in their, uh, in their growth phase, they were much smaller and shorter and there was a lower success rate. The results of the research supported the enhanced nutrient hypothesis, which means that the more food that you have in the water for these larvae to subsist on, the more successful those larvae are going to be. Needless to say, now that we know that timing is a major contributing factor to the success of crown of thorn sea star larvae, it will definitely be the focus of future research. So that was a little bit about the research that I did while I was at university. I hope after that video you guys can probably tell that crown of thorns sea stars misunderstood that they are are actually amazing, amazing indicators about what us humans are doing to the ocean environment because their population growth and the changes that they're experiencing are direct reflections of what us humans are doing to the ocean environment. My research was specifically looking at how coastal development and increased rainfall associated with climate change are impacting crown of thorns from the bottom up. And then the scientists who are looking at the top down theory are looking at the removal of predators, which is also something that we have done through our shell trade. As you can see, the top down and the bottom up theories are both right. They're both contributing factors that are making crown of thorns more successful. So hopefully you guys enjoyed today's video. I know it was a little bit heavy on the science side, but I've definitely had a lot of uh, requests for this video, a lot of folks who were interested in what I did for my research and what my thesis was all about. Thank you guys so much for joining me, and I hope I'll see you guys around at the next video. Mahalo.